Hey, it's Joey with TechNet Edge, and I'm here with Isaac. How are you, Isaac? I'm doing great. All right, so tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, I've been at Microsoft almost eight years now. Uh, started in various capacities, and today I own uh, the server virtualization marketing uh, piece for Hyper-V. So I do technical product management uh, as well as outbound uh, management. So there has been some really good changes in Hyper-V since we RTM'd, mm -hmm. and, and now we're in the Windows Server 2008 R2 beta time, timeline here. Why don't you tell us about some of the changes that have occurred uh, since the beta release. Okay, well we have some big changes in general coming up in R2. Uh, if, uh, you have, if you've been living under a rock, I'm sure you maybe haven't heard about uh, live migration features that's coming out in Windows Server 2008 R2. So that's a big feature that we're really hanging our hat, uh, hat on and a lot of customers really want that feature. Uh, next piece is really doing uh, cluster shared volume support as well, uh, which is uh, basically leveraging the live migration capability to make that management easier. But since then, from the beta milestone coming up to RC and RTM, we've made some really big changes. Uh, I think a lot of customers are going to be pre pleasantly surprised about it. Uh, one of those big changes is uh, we're going to support up to 64 logical processors uh, from a Hyper-V perspective. So when you look at that uh, from an RTM perspective, of Windows Server 2008, we only supported 24. And so essentially we're going to two times that um, in the RC time frame. So if you were playing with the beta bits of R2, you would have noticed you only had 32 logical proc support. So we've since doubled that uh, since the last milestone and we're going into RC, we'll be having that. Uh, another really uh, interesting feature I think a lot of people are gonna be surprised about is what we call processor compatibility for live migration. And that's really a, a, a sweet feature because what it does is it allows you to migrate from different chip versions in the same processor family uh, in, a, in, a, in a certain cluster. So say for example if uh, you have an Intel Pentium 4 and you want to go to an Intel Core Duo or something like that, some, some newer chipset, and they're both in the same cluster, you can actually now do a live migration from the Pentium 4 to the newer version and vice versa. So you don't have to have identical hardware to be able to perform a live migration. So it's really cool and what it essentially does is from a P4 point of view, and you have the VM running on that P4 machine, it'll go and it'll talk to the host that it's going to do a live migration to, and it'll negotiate and find out what the, essentially the lowest common denominator is between those two chipsets, and then it'll utilize that functionality when it moves to the newer chipset. So essentially you can keep your, your VM up and running the whole entire time. You don't have to reboot it to take advantage uh, of, of the migration. However, if you want to take advantage of the superset functionality that's on that new chip, all you have to do is reboot the, the VM on that new host and it automatically detects that. But if you need to have critical uh, applications running inside that VM and need to migrate them over, no problem. The processor compatibility lets you do that. Does that happen the same way when I'm going back? If I have a core, uh, let's say a Core 2 Duo and I'm jumping back down to that P4 in that cluster, say to patch that Core 2 Duo, is that still a possibility? Absolutely, you can go back and forth. So essentially it'll do the same negotiation process. It'll find out, oh, this superset functionality is not supported. It'll go to the lowest common denominator here and then it'll transfer it over. And now the VM only takes advantage of that subset of, uh, of uh, functionality within that P4 machine. And then if I'm moving up, is there a way I can enable that advanced functionality? Only with a reboot. So okay. you would have to completely reboot the VM and then it would take advantage of that superset functionality if you're moving to a higher chipset. Excellent. Yeah, so it's going to be really cool. We're really excited about that. Um, a few things to note about that. It is off by default, so you have to enable it to be able to move over. Um, also, you uh, can set it up on a per VM basis. So you don't have to do it across all your hosts. So if you have five hosts, you can do node or host one, two, and, or excuse me, guest one, two, and three. Four and five, you can turn it off by default. So that's one thing to note if you're going to try this functionality out in the RC time frame and you try to do live migration and it fails and you have different chipsets, enable the processor compat and, and you're ready to go. Is that a simple group policy or PowerShell script? How does that work? Uh, it's just a checkbox right now. Okay. So we're going to be able to enable that through a WMI interface as well, just through um, the, the WMI interface that you manage Hyper-V with. So right now it's just a little checkbox, so you'll be able to script that with WMI. Excellent. What, what else do you guys have going on in, in, in the newer builds of Hyper-V? Have there been changes to networking? Have you tweak the, the Hyper-V stack at all, what else has happened? That's actually a good point. So we have made a couple of notable changes when it comes down to specifically the networking stack and some of the features we have coming out in R2. So uh, one of those changes is uh, what's called Chimney, so TCP IP offload, right? And also VMQ. So essentially what we've done is we've disabled those by default as well. So those were enabled by default in beta and previous versions to that. 
uh, we did some more testing and we uh, took a look at, at Chimney uh, or TCP IP offload and discovered that there uh, are certain workloads that it's recommended for and others that it's, it's not. So instead of having it turned on by default and ending up uh, you know, regressing performance and having a bad user experience, we decided to turn it off by default and have uh, administrators be able to turn it on at their discretion. So the few of the workloads that we talk about that is good for Chimney are, are ones that deploy large payloads of, of TCP IP traffic, right? So SQL might be one backups. Live migration is actually a, a perfect uh, candidate for, for Chimney support. Uh, so that is also enabled through a WMI interface via SCVMM or System Center Virtual Machine Manager. Um, but you can also do it through a registry uh, entry or registry edit on the local box as well. Uh, VMQ, same thing. We also uh, disabled that by default. And that wasn't necessarily due to any kind of performance ramifications with workloads. It really doesn't matter if you have it on or off. It doesn't degrade performance in any way for certain workloads or, 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 uh, or vice versa. Essentially, we had uh, just a limited uh, hardware test bed because it's, uh, it's actually built into hardware. So VMQ is actually built in through uh, different manufacturers such as Intel and Broadcom and some of these other folks. And actually, uh, Broadcom has announced support. Intel's the only one that, that has the, the the actual NIC out there today that supports VMQ. So uh, due to some testing resources, we decided to pull that back. And once you have a VMQ enabled uh, NIC, you can turn it on the same way as Chimney, uh, WMI, or, or RegEdit, and you're ready to go. So let me ask you some questions regarding Hyper-V in Server 2008 R2. Mm -hmm. What's the customer response for those folks who have been out there early adopting uh, into the new Hyper-V? You know, actually, the response has been phenomenal. So we, we have a lot of uh, different programs out there that some folks may know about called the TAP program. Um, and a lot of the customers just absolutely love the functionality that we have with live migration, the CSV uh, manageability now. You just have this one big data store that you can manage instead of having to carve up some LUNs um, to do any kind of migration. So they really love a lot of these things. The performance uh, around the, the, the feedback around performance has been great. Uh, we get just glowing feedback around that. So, so a lot of customers are really looking forward to R2 uh, and what we have coming up. So they said, hey, Hyper-V V1 was a great stable product for a V1. They were really shocked about that, you know, because typically <laughs> they always say, hey, we're going to wait till Service Pack 2 or 3, whatever comes out. Uh, the ones that deployed early loved it. And uh, obviously Microsoft.com is a, a heavy user of Hyper-V today. Um, some, um, some folks may not know this, but MSDN and TechNet are 100% on Hyper-V, so completely virtualized and MSCOM is 50% virtualized today. So their uh, MSIT is really chomping at the bit as well to get their hands on the Hyper-V bits and, and uh, in R2 and really start to deploy that in the production environment. So they actually have a 15 node cluster deployed today uh, running uh, R2 and, and Hyper-V um, to doing some, uh, some testing on that um, in, in their environment. So we obviously have some large scale deployments out there and we're really pushing it to the max and, and um, I think customers are gonna be pleasantly surprised when our two uh, RTMs. What's changed in terms of management? I mean, let's kind of separate ourselves from SCVMM a little bit and just talk about the out-of-the-box management. Mm -hmm. What enhancements were made uh, in the R2 release? Well, you know, when we really took a look, uh, a, lo a long, hard look at the individual management from an out-of-the-box perspective in V1, and uh, we actually got it pretty good. We got it right pretty good. I mean, the, you look at the Hyper-V manager, a lot of good stuff in there. So we made some uh, slight tweaks to the, the UI, but nothing drastic. It's still very familiar. If you use Hyper-V V1 today, you'll still be able to use that same functionality. You'll be familiar with it. We beef, beefed up our WMI interface as well. And we're also making some connections with PowerShell. So obviously PowerShell V2 has got a lot of stuff coming out in R2. So we wanted to make sure we tie up with that. Um, so we have some guidance coming around uh, around that for PowerShell and WMI kind of integration with Hyper-V. So definitely having, uh, if you have that, that scripting knowledge and love to code and want to do a lot of those, uh, those scripts, definitely do that. But for the non-code monkeys out there, you can just do it within the, the UI and, and point and click you know, your heart away and, and it's still the same experience that you had before. Good stuff. So where can folks go to get more information on Hyper-V? Well, obviously, Microsoft.com slash Hyper-V is one of the best places to go to get all the, the technical resources you want. So we're actually making some changes there as well. We're going to have one landing page for all the technical resources you want. And we're breaking it up in actually planning, pre-deployment, deployment, and uh, management capabilities. And then we also have another section called Workload Guidance. So if you want to do Exchange, SQL, SharePoint on top of Hyper-V, you can take a look at those docs right there, and it gives you uh, guidance on how to do that. Excellent. Isaac, thanks for your time, man. Yeah, thanks for having me, Joe. I appreciate it.